Hi kids, it's Internet Grandpa here, and today we're going to continue reading A Gathering of Days. It's a, called A New England Girl's Journal, 1830-1832. Let's start right away. Friday, June 10th, 1831. The truth is told about the quilt. It happened in this manner and Maddie was the cause. With the weaver here these days, there has been considerable talk of linens and bedding, sewing and quilts, quilting designs and their stories, flying geese, moon over mountains, star of Bethlehem. She knows a host of them by name, both those she's made and otherwise, and likes to talk about them. Then you tell the story, says Maddie to me, about the reds from the Russian's coat, and grabbed the father's trousers. But what can you have in mind? I asked her words being so outlandish that they caught me unaware. Embarrassed by my answer to her, Maddie now shrilled at me. The Russian's coat, you know it, Kath. And you and Kathy took the quilt and... Maddie, I gasped, too late. Catherine, she queried, drawing a thread and smoothing down her stitching. Does this child mean yet another quilt, one I know not of? Until that moment, no lie was asked, as I had reminded Cassie so many months ago. As for the deception itself, I'd long since found the justification in Teacher Holt's well-known remarks and Union Jack's opinions. But now, I must tell the truth or lie, deny that Cassie and I had done what Maddie had seen us do. I blurted out, "'Twas anyway a very old quilt. You wouldn't have liked it at all." Then, red-faced and tearful, I told it all. The missing book, the message found, our hard-won decision, and the precepts given in school, even Ace's whispering and the stolen shipman pies. Catherine, Catherine was all she said. Then, <sighs> I'm so put to the test. She made an attempt to resume the sewing, but only snarled the thread. As for my part, I could not speak, and I remember nothing of Maddie in this while. Come, she said, calm regained, and led us to the summer kitchen to start the evening meal. Halfway through that work, she exclaimed, and did you not think on the danger to you? What cruel misfortunes might have occurred, harm to you or Cassie? No, I said. He was cold, and twas winter then. Dear child, she said, for you are but a child. Then she advanced as if to embrace me, but soon withdrew. Come, she said with quick effort to be brisk. I'm afraid we have fallen idle. Run quick, Maddie, and fetch us some water. Catherine, that fire needs wood, and as for the quilt, I must think on it, must search out what to do. Early morning, Saturday, June 11th, 1831. Last night I heard them talking, mostly her voice, then father's. They spoke so low that words were indistinct. Then her laugh rang out. But Charlie, she said, it is really so funny. Grab the father's trousers. Then he chuckled, then murmurings. Then were we all asleep. Later Saturday, I am to make a replacing quilt. That she has decided and our father agreed. When I protested, I could not do it. That I knew hemming, running, and felling, overstitch, and buttonhole but not to make a quilt. She smiled despite the solemn moment and my urgencies. All that should make it easy, she said. Beside, I'm here now to teach you. Then she stretched out a hand to me, whereat I cried as I had done bef before, nor have I done for months and years. And when at last I looked at her, I saw her own eyes glistened. Chapter 13, Monday, June 13th, 
1831. As soon as the clothes were set to boiling, she brought down her pattern book, filled with sketches and hints from friends and various notations. I considered each one with care and from the whole number selected three, none of which had difficult curves or seemed in any other way likely to be too demanding of my present skills. From these I chose, for two principal reasons, the one called Mariner's Compass. It requires a background of white. For that I can use our old linen sheeting, already mending as far as can be, with outside edges long sewn to the center and some still further patched. Now that her boxes of house goods are come, I need not scruple excessively over such use of ours. Mariner's Compass is little known here, though popular near Boston, and north as far as Maine. Tis said to be made by sailors' wives that their dear ones would be preserved and brought safely home. Tuesday, June 14th, 1831. Saying, well begun, we're half done, she showed me. On my return from school, where she had laid out snips and scraps collected from how many shirts and dresses and salvaged from other worn clothing. You'll need to cut them very exact, was all I had of instruction before commencing my task. Oh, if the Jew but knew the use to which I put his scissors. This cutting is a tedious manner. One must bend to it very close. Also, she watches over me to see that I take sufficient care in laying out the pieces, the least of the cloth be wasted. Wednesday, June 15th, 1831. A story from Uncle Jack. A farmer wagered he knew to the pound how much his gray mare could draw. A bystanding stranger selected a log. The farmer nodded, a dollar was wagered, and the mayor hitched up. This time it seemed the farmer would lose for the mayor could not budge the log. Before he'd forfeit the dollar, though, the Yankee rechecked the scene, and there he discovered a pair of wet mittens lying on the log. No sooner did he, did he lift them off than the mayor moved smartly along, the farmer winning his wager. But is it a true story, Daniel asked. Do you think it might have happened? I mean, sir, would a really good farmer know his horse so exactly? and what a mayor can do. Thursday, June 16th, 1831. Joshua surprised us this afternoon by meeting us at school. He had it in mind to walk down to the shipments and if he was going to go that far, would do it with company. His mission afforded a second surprise. Teacher Holt had said he'd find Joshua some books and Joshua once the most indifferent of scholars, had troubled to come this long way just to claim the favor. Jay now confesses he aspires to study at Mr. Dudley Levitt's school down to Meredith. Saturday, June 18th, 1831. Every day I must cut, trim, and sort pieces for my quilt. I thought to have had all ready by now, but seemed to have scarcely started. You would not think it would take so long just to prepare the work. When I remarked on my lack of progress, she t quickly took the occasion to point her moral out. Perhaps had you known what you're learning now, you would not have so quickly agreed to what you did last winter. Monday, June 20th, 1831. I dare say it went well with Asa since giving his verse to Sophie. Every day this summer term, she walks homeward with Cassie and me, and none of us mention what all of us know. The road we take is the longest way around to Sophie's own front door. Lately, I notice nearly every day, Asa, by what coincidence, finds himself at fence side just after school lets out. Wednesday, June 22nd, 1831. Nothing as we have done it before seems to satisfy her now. Loosen the bed sheets first from the corners. That way the strain will be less great and the wear prolonged. Catherine, Maddie, don't pull them so. 
Never mind what I've told you girls. She is that particular how each thing is done. Do mind this, do mind that. Work worth doing is worth doing well, I hear at every hand. Yet, just as it seems, I bring only vexation. She'll take my side against Daniel's complaint or even caution my father. But Charles, she's but a child. Yesterday, I came upon her as she repacked a trunk in which she'd brought clothes out of Boston. Do you like these, Catherine? She asked, holding up a set of cuffs and a matching collar. When I allowed by word and gesture that I thought them beautiful, she said quickly they should be mine and gave them over to me. Thursday, June 23rd, 1831. I had a great, we had a great storm last night. It split two trees near the west field fence. This morning, water flowed over the road like a new spun river. Indeed, at the steps at the corner of the barn, we had an infant waterfall which lasted half the day. I think there were few displays more grand than a summer's thunderstorm. Maddie feels quite the opposite and passed the whole of last night's storm with a shawl pressed to her eyes. Friday, June 24th, 1831. With the addition of these cuts today, I now have sufficient pieces to begin the figures. The background will take longer as tis larger in extent. Monday, June 27th, 1831. Weekday, Saturday, and Sabbath day fly. We have very much to do, to which is added my quilting. At this, I stitch and stitch away. I must give to her to approve each block as it's completed. Lately, the weather is very fine and the evenings long. The stricture is to be home by dark, which so shortens our winter visits, hardly touches us now. Night after night, our yard or the shipman's rings with laughter as we engage in blind man's bluff or snap the whip or similar diversions. Daniel and Asa have become fast friends, sometimes a blessing, sometimes not, as they will chase after me and Cassie with some horrid toad they've caught or garden snake they've captured. Hurrah for July the 4th! We passed the whole of this day in town, having departed just as soon as morning chores released us. The sun was not yet fully risen when, with packed meal beside us in the wagon and well-cooled keg of cider beside, we five left the yard. Even as we rumbled toward the town, we heard the bells begin to ring and the firing of cannon. The streets around the green were thronged with noisy, with a million cries and small boys going everywhere, lustily drumming on pails. From time to time, a firecracker would explode nearby. We saw two teams that nearly panicked, the horses rearing though confined by harness and whinnying in terror. Babe and Nellie seemed deaf-eared throughout and were calm all day. Sometimes I feel I must love these beasts for their unfailing patience, their enormous size. Wagons and chaises surrounded the green whereon at nine o'clock promptly the militia paraded. Presently all the marchers stopped and stood most steadily in their places while fife and fiddle and drummers performed. The last of their tunes being Yankee Doodle, which was the most applauded. Next was read in ringing tones the Declaration of Independence, this being followed by a prayer given by the militia captain. A soldier's prayer is even more forceful than one by a minister. Perhaps tis the unexpectedness of sometimes strength so sweetly gentled. I am reminded of that day when father insisted that he alone would attend the cooking. Daniel and Asa soon slipped off and father went with Uncle Jack to refresh himself at the tavern. However, we women wanted not for diversion and hardly knew they were gone. The scene before us was constantly changing, and at 11 o'clock in the morning, the oration was given. A judge, J. Wax, came down from Plymouth, especially for the event. At the end, he espied two fellows with thin white hair and pipe stem legs, wearing what seemed the well-worn remains 
of that well-loved uniform, the buff-colored trousers and deep blue coats of General Washington's soldiers. The speaker's eager imagination placed them both at Valley Forge and lauded them as patriots by whose example we might be inspired and called on them to reply. At this day, they nudged and poked each other, grinned in embarrassed toothlessness, and only later did we all learn these were Hessians who'd served with Burgoyne and shared in his defeat. By midday, it having grown quite warm, we sat beside the wagon, grateful for the wedge of shade that its height afforded. There did we eat the meal we brought and the outdoor air enhancing its flavor, and presently Father reappeared to keep us company. He'd heard reports of burns, one maiming through misfired explosions. The afternoon hours drifted by. Some who'd heard of father's remarriage took the occasion to come around and examine his new wife. I think she came off well in this. She seemed not discomforted and replied most pleasantly as she was spoken to. There was one final delight in the day. As we made our way towards home, weary, warm, and satisfied, I looked back over the valley. At this moment, there arose from the green a final display of fireworks against the evening sky. Even Daniel applauded this and for once did not complain or make a fall shy comparison about how tis done in Boston. Thursday, July 7th, 1831. Very hot again today and with no prospect of rain. The raspberries are poor this year. We even consider whether it is worthwhile to turn them into jam. Because it has lately been so dry, Father is in daily fear that we may suffer a fire. We've stored some buckets of water in the house and are especially careful over our cooking now. Walking home from school today, we saw how deeply our bare feet imprinted the soft velvet dust. The Shipman family just now left, they having passed here a pleasant visit after the supper hour. Friday, July 8th, 1831. Maddie was stung by a bee today, which caused her face to swell. I noticed that she came not to me, but rather took her complaint to her, who quickly put her handiwork down, and taking Maddie by the hand, led her to the summer kitchen. There she mixed salt and water together until they formed a crusty paste, which she applied to the sting. It proved a useful remedy with which we were not acquainted. I watched the whole of this from my stool where I sat with churn between my knees, willing the butter to come. Later, she sat with him a while and sang small funny songs to her. Our mother would have done the same and did so once for me. Monday, July 11th, 1831. We hear they are having difficulty to raise the money to complete the Bunker Hill Monument. Solicitations have been made, but fall short of the mark. Six years ago, when she took Daniel to witness the marker's dedication, General Lafayette from France and our own Senator Daniel Webster both were there. Daniel had said they were the same because they shared the name. And now, she explained, as a storyteller will, who has a particular point to make. I proudly add that Senator Webster also was the son of a farmer in the state of New Hampshire. Hurrah, yelled Maddie and I at this, but Daniel looked none too pleased. Mr. Webster had given a rousing speech as he was expected to do, being well known for declaiming. In it, he said that the monument, both because of its height and location, would now greet the voyager who entered Boston Harbor. Conversely, and equally fitting, he thought it would provide the traveler departing with his last sight of home. Tuesday, July 12th, 1831. Daniel has found a most perfect new name by which I and Maddie too may address his mother. Mam said he, combining her name with the common mama. However, she heard it otherwise. Daniel, she cried, what an elegant thought. 
we can say it is after the French, and thus the height of fashion. Be that as it may, it pleased me well. Also, it seemed her light remarks served to conceal true feeling. Later, I told her, good night, mammon. It was, and both of us knew it to be, the first I'd addressed her directly. And we're up around 20 minutes, so I think we'll wrap this one up here and we'll start a new one. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this story. I really uh, appreciate your listening in. And I want to ask you to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, if you look down in the description, you'll find links to our Facebook page and email address. Please feel free to send a comment or a request. Um, maybe you got a book you'd like us to read. Maybe you'd like us to say hello to someone. Any of those things. Whatever. Well, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.